hi everybody. Hi. If, hello over there on the other side. Um, if you've got your Bible, please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And uh, I know some of you have spoken to people who say, we want to hear what you have to say about this particular passage. And I have to say, I'm just relying on the grace of God to help us navigate through this together. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to be reading from verse 2 until verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We continue for our series called Wild. And we're looking at the the life of the church in Corinth, and um, this is how it reads. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the tradition, even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered, dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is, a disgr- it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover the head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the, is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For a woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. And all these are from God. Therefore, judge for yourself. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? Vili, I'm glad you're sitting at the front. For her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. I'm kidding, Billy. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for grace. Thank you for truth. Thank you for incredible time of worship where we can just come before our Father, Lord We who with unveiled faces behold the glory of God, that our faces are not like Moses' face which was covered, but now, Lord, the veil has been removed and we can now come and face God and worship and tell him how amazing, beautiful, wonderful he is. And we want to echo that, Lord, from the worship time. We want to echo that yet again and say, you are amazing, you are good, you are awesome. Lord, we know that um, we can never understand Scripture without the power of the Holy Spirit. And today I pray, Lord, may you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that he may bring truth to us. He may help us, Lord, even as we encounter some of the most difficult passages, unusual. But we pray for grace to come. We pray for heavenly wisdom. And we ask, Lord, that you come and embrace us, Lord, and take us on a journey together as we, be, as we continue to understand this passage and this book together as a church. I ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. You have to to admit, it's one of those passages that you read and you think, what is this all about? Isn't it? But that's not where I would love to start this uh, this morning. I would love to start somewhere else. And um, and just, just bring a, a bit of summary so that we are on the same page. Because there's, it sounds like there's a little, little bit of tautology. There's a little bit of repetition there. It sounds like there's a lot that seems to be happening there. Paul sounds like he's repeating himself a lot. But um, I just want to just very briefly summarize some of the stuff that you already have in your, in your mind. So, for instance, he says, the head of a man is Christ. The head of a woman is man. That's why he says, he says, women should cover their heads. Men should never cover their heads. Men should, not, should never shave their hair. Men should shave their hair or should make them short and women shouldn't. 
And woman is not independent of man. Man is not independent of woman. And as you read this, you realize that this language is really grounded in Genesis 2. Is really, Paul is beginning to speak not just out of good ideas. He's beginning to observe the traditions that have been there for a long time. And he's passing on a body of truth to the church. But today, this is where we're going to go as we unpack the scripture. I just want to bring three things to you. The first one is some misconceptions as we read a passage like this. So misconceptions in reading a passage like this. We're going to be looking at those before we do anything. So we set the scene, we create the framework within which we would now begin to interpret this passage. And the second thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at a language in the, ch- in the Bible where we look at symbols and principles and how we shouldn't use symbols as principles, and we shouldn't use principles as symbols, and, but we should see how the two work together. And lastly, we say, now what do we do with this? Okay? The misconceptions, some of the ways that we can look at the passage, <laughs> and some of the ways that we have chosen to look at a passage. Secondly, we're going to look at what actually is happening here in terms of reading scripture, where you have principles and symbols and how they work together, not against each other. And then lastly, we're going to say, so what? What does this mean for us? So, the first one, misconceptions. It's interesting that there's so many misconceptions when it comes to the reading of Scripture in general, how people think and and how we think about Scripture. And by the way, the reason I'm saying this to you is because, as you know very well, all the things I'm going to mention just now, some of you, will say, that's exactly how I think. You're going to read it, you're going to hear it, and you're going to say, that's exactly how I thought about this passage. I've always thought about it. What's wrong with the way I think? Surely nothing is wrong. With it. I've been taught to think this way. The first misconception, by the way, don't worry about, is called defeater argument approach. A defeater argument is an argument that you use based on a particular passage to try and qualify why you should do things the, same, the way that you, you do things. So let me say, for instance, here's a defeat argument for this passage. You would say, do you remember 1 Corinthians 11? I'll say, yes, I do remember. Do you remember it says that women shall cover their head? I'll say, yes. Do you remember it says men shall not cover their head? Yes. Do we still do that in the church today? And then I look around And then I said, no. And then he says, okay, if that's the case, it means certain passages, you just have to glance over them. You just have to ignore them sometimes. If that's the case, if the Bible says that, if that's what scripture says about the passage, surely there are certain passages we shouldn't take seriously. Because otherwise, if we were to take them seriously, we should take this one seriously as well. We should be coming into the context like this and we should be seeing every woman here wearing something on their head and every man not wearing anything. If anything today, in my observation, no woman is wearing anything. But the opposite is true. Only one man is wearing something. (laughs) So a defeater argument is using a passage of scripture to try and qualify but, and, and distorting it to try and qualify why you would not do certain things that are found in other passages of Scripture. Which means you are going to say to me, if it says that, and yet now we're not doing it, it means also with other passages, we should have the same approach. And what you've done there is you've in, misinterpreted one passage, and you've used that passage to also misinterpret the rest of Scripture. That's any defeater argument. And I've heard it many times. People say that, they say, oh, this passage, it says that, but we don't do that anymore. And if we don't do that anymore, surely we shouldn't do that with other passages as well. The second one, by the way, which is almost the opposite, but not quite the opposite, is you interpret it, you do it as it says. Do it as it says approach. And in theological circles, they'll call it literalism or biblicism. But the interesting thing about this one, do as it says. Of course, we have to do as Scripture says. But but this has layers, you see. There's a layer of do as you say. And there's another layer of do as as it says. The first layer of do as it says is, if the Scripture says this, it means you literally do as it says. 
me tell you wh- where this um, argument falls short. Most of the people, there's a lot of you do as it says in here. But some of, both, most of you still have your eyes. Why have you got your eyes? You might think, why are you saying that? Because scripture says, if your eye causes you to sin, do as it says. Gouge it out. Get rid of it. Take it out. But actually, we've missed a principle in that. Because it says, do as it says. It says that the Bible says this, which means obey the Bible. Be true to scripture. But we miss the interpretation of what he really, truly said. What is Jesus trying to say? We approach the Bible in an incredibly naive way. Of course we want to be obedient to Scripture. But the interesting thing is, even as you do as it says, believe me, you're very selective. Believe me, you're quite choosy. Because if you went, you would not have your eyes. You might probably have lost your, both your, your hands. Is it do as you say? Of course it is. But it is a layer of do as you say. A third argument is one where we say, it's a, I'll call it a liberal approach. Where you read this passage, and all of a sudden you read it and he says, and you say, there are certain passages of scripture that are timeless truth. But there are certain passages that are not timeless truth. Which means, when I read certain passages, I know that they're meant to be forever. But this is not one of them. And by the way, the liberal approach will say, this passage makes me feel uncomfortable. This reading of this passage, the fact that we are saying women should wear their, 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 their scarves or something on, and men should not wear anything, I feel very uncomfortable by this passage. Therefore, I need to skip over this passage. The liberal approach says skip over it. Do not focus on it. Do not think about it because it's just irrelevant for our time. And they'll say, don't be silly. Don't listen to people who say we should observe this passage because this passage doesn't really work. It doesn't apply to us because it's, just a, it's, a, it's a cultural thing. It's just rooted in culture, and that's all there is. We should not even think about this passage at all. And they'll say, you're silly, you are naive. If you still read this passage in a way that should be read, you might be sitting there and say, what should we do then? How should we look at this? That's exactly where I wanted to bring us. I wanted to bring us to a place where you think, yes, you have just focused on my view of this passage and the way I would have interpreted it, but you've just debunked it. You just said that's not quite how it works. So, how does it work then? And I want to suggest principles and symbols. And what Paul is trying to say here. What does Paul really, really mean by this passage? Shall we look at that together? Are you looking at that? I can see some of you are holding off. And you are thinking, can you just get there? Because I just want to know what he says. You know what it says, it's written there. (laughs) Principles and symbols. Before I tell you what it says, again, I'm dangling a carrot here. (sighs) Let's take a few examples to help you. Because I'm taking on a journey. Here's an example. The Bible says, when you come together, Greet one another with a holy kiss. Isn't that what the Bible says? It says when you come together, greet one another with a holy kiss. What's the Bible trying to say? And let me ask you a question. How many of you got holy kisses this morning? None? Oh, I'll read. <laughs> let me tell you why I'm using this passage. The reason I'm using this passage, you'll see exactly how this passage works in directly to this other passage that we are looking at now. Because the Bible says, greet one another with a holy kiss. And by the way, it's not just one passage. It's there in 1 Corinthians 16. It's right there in Romans 16. It's also there in 1 Thessalonians 5. And it's there in 2 Corinthians 13. It's there in four or five passages that says, greet one another with a holy kiss. And you're not observing it? 
How sad. But listen, listen to this. When you look at a passage like that, what you're picking up there is that you're picking up a principle. You're also picking up a symbol. You're picking up a symbol and you're picking up a principle. What is a symbol? A holy kiss. A greeting with a holy kiss. When you come together, greet one another with a holy kiss. What is a principle? Brotherly affection. When you come together, show brotherly affection to one another. But the way people sh did that, the way people showed brotherly affection or an affection to one another, that we belong to one family, that we are together, do you know how they showed it? Holy kiss. But a symbol just signifies the principle. But we shouldn't say the symbol is the, the principle. And let's, make, let's come with examples. Right now, let me say this. This morning, you showed brotherly affection to many people, but you didn't use a holy kiss. You use other ways. If you go to different parts of the world, people don't show brotherly love in the same way. Do you call it sisterly love? I don't know how you call it. In, in, in. If you go to Europe, the way they show brotherly love is they shake hands, right? And in other parts of Europe, they, they will tap you and push you back, which means don't go too close. In other parts of the world, you rub your noses. You know that, right? In other parts of the world, you do kisses on both sides. All right? The cheek, kiss the cheek, this side, kiss the cheek, this side. And by the way, when you're in China, I'm back again. <laughs> when you're in China, never hug until it's safe to do so. But also, if you go to other places, I just want to warn you people from Dubai, don't try and kiss people on their cheeks because they'll, get, they'll freak out. They'll think it's not normal. They'll think it's not real. It's not true. What are you trying to do? You impose. Give them the space. What am I trying to do here? I'm trying to help you to say, why have we changed things? Why have we changed the way we look at it? Why is it that we're doing it differently? Why is it that maybe if you go to other parts of the world, people are still very much doing the same thing? The truth is, every part of Scripture is timeless truth. Every bit of scripture is timeless truth, which means we need to read it, and as we read it, we need to believe it, and as we believe it, it needs to reveal Christ to us. Every single one of them. Secondly, every single part of scripture is rooted in some kind of cultural context, and if we were to ever say, oh, this one is culturally um, relevant for them, but it's not for us right now, if we say, oh, it's just culture, this passage, what we are saying is, is literally every passage, literally every passage we shouldn't observe because it's all rooted in culture somehow. But what we need to do, we need to say all scripture is God-breathed and is useful right now for rebuking, for teaching, for equ equipping and encouragement and everything. But equally, every scripture is rooted in culture and a tradition, but we need to say, what is it trying to say to us? Which is where we are right now. So, this passage that is talking about women wearing their hair, covering their heads, and men not covering their heads. Basically, what Paul is saying, he says, in this, there is a principle, there is a symbol. What is the symbol? Cover your head. What is the principle? There are three principles which I would love to draw to you now. The first principle is this. Paul is saying, when you come together, this is the first time ever that he's ever talked about the meeting when believers come together. Remember, he said it in, in, in chapter 10 and in chapter 11. Before this, he's never said it. But this is the first time. He says, when you come together, there must be a symbol when you come together, and that symbol of head covering and men not covering their heads means this. It means gender distinctions 
which means men being men and women and, and being women are preserved when we come to the time of worship. Which means when we come to God, ladies, God loves you just the way you are. When you come before him, you don't have to try and be a man. Because God accepts women just as they are. And, he, and worship is a symbol that God is reigning and ruling among us. And he's accepting people just as they are. And if you are a man here, be yourself. Because God accepts you just as you are. And the way in which people demonstrated that they were women. And the way in which people demonstrate they were men is that some will cover their heads and some will not cover their heads as they come before God to worship. And the principle is, you are who God has created you to be. Do not be someone else of a different uh, gender. The second one is the one of headship where it reveals the head and it exposes the head. And God is saying here, both genders, if you are a man, Paul is saying here, you, are not ex- you, are, you, you, you do not exist without an authority over your life, that you have an authority over your life. Who's your authority? Jesus Christ. But if you are a woman, he says your authority is your husband. And let me just say what this passage really means. And this is for men. When you hear that, he said, you're sitting next to your wife. And you are saying, remember I told you. (laughs) Didn't I say, I'm your head. (laughs) Obey me. But that's not why Paul said that. And by the way, often when the passage like this was said, often people never would have not said, God is your authority man. Men thought they never had authority. They thought, okay, I'm just an authority over my family. And I'm, I don't have anyone as an authority. But Paul is changing something here. Because he's now telling you. He says, man, you have an authority over you. There's an authority figure. Who's the authority figure? Christ. Women, you have an authority figure. But hey, man, the only way you will interpret authority really well. The only way you will know what true authority is. Is if you recognize the authority over your life. If, if you are really attached to Jesus Christ, is if you really lead based on how Jesus leads, is if you direct in the way that Jesus th- th- done. What did Jesus do? He led with love. He encountered us with love. He was never harsh with us. He was not imposing. He was so loving, so caring. He came and he died for us. He sacrificed. He laid his life down for us. And as you hear this, you might be thinking, I know of the way that authority has been used right now. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I really don't want that. That's not what Paul is trying to say. He's trying to say there needs to be humility. Because Jesus Christ made himself nothing until the point of death, even death on the cross. So for men here, I just want to call you that this is a big call on us to really give ourselves to the living God. To take God seriously. To say, if I'm this, if God, you've called, have entrusted this authority to me, I will do my best to give myself to you so that I will lead my family really well. Because that's what God is doing. And it's a call upon men. Every man here, I believe God is doing that. He's calling us to rise up now. He's calling us to be protective. He's calling us to be caring. He's calling us to, to put others first. He's calling us to be self-giving. He's calling us to not be self Centered, but self-sacrificial. He's calling us into this incredible opportunity that we have where authority has been redefined. Because the fall has redefined authority altogether. And God says, when you come together in worship, let that authority change altogether. Let it be to the glory of Christ. Because Christ has been your example in how authority is to be exercised. Thirdly, sexually available. In, the f- in this time... Particularly if you were a Jew, if you walked into a a meeting like this, if you came inside and women were not wearing anything on their heads and you walked in as a Jew, you didn't know Jesus Christ, or maybe you observed the Torah, if you walked in and a woman was not covered, 
it will be a massive offense to you. You'll be thinking, what is going on here? Why? Because in Corinth, there was a temple of Aphrodite. Every prostitute would not cover their head, and they will say, I'm sexually available. So Paul is saying, in the time when we come together like this, let there be that incredible modesty together. What am I saying here? I've got a couple of pictures to show you what I'm saying. When we come together, man, you are who you are before God, and you're not like Eddie is that, have you ever seen this guy? Do you know him? Have you, does anyone know him? All right, Andrew knows him. <laughs> he's a British comedian, and uh, he's, he's for a Labour party. And by the way, this man, he's a man. And Paul is saying, Paul is saying, when you come together, you are not like this. Because... The picture you get here is that I am not who I am. I'm someone else. And by the way, God accepts you and loves you just as you are. You don't have to look like this. This is the 21st century interpretation of what this means. It means be yourself. Come before God. And Vili, who is Vili? This passage is not saying that your Bob Marley hairstyle that you're thinking of. No, I'm just joking. I don't know. Have you, have you ever cut your hair? No? All right. There you go. We should be excommunicating many today, <laughs> including myself. Because here's the thing. When you begin to read a passage and it says, your hair should be long or short, the question, which is a legalistic question, you see where the legalism comes? It says, how long? How short? That's an interesting one. But the other interesting one is that Jesus is depicted in pretty much all the movies and all the, the pictures as having long hair, isn't it? That's an interesting. Have you ever thought about that? That Jesus must have missed Paul somehow? Or Paul, when he was thinking about it, he missed Jesus? Uh, hey, by the way, I don't think that's the Jesus of Scripture. It's just the Jesus of the 21st century. But anyway, it's got nothing to do with that. Really? You are safe. You can keep your hair. <laughs> but don't come like that. For ladies, but this also doesn't mean that man, when you come before God, you, you abandon who you are as a man. Hold on to that. That's what God has made you to be. And he delights in that. And he has plans and purposes for your life. Ladies, has anyone here ever watched? I know examples that I'm making here are a bit Western examples. I've been thinking about other examples. But anyway, I'll come up with. Ladies, has anyone here, here ever watched Pride and Prejudice? All right, there we are. Oh, by the way, let's be obedient to Scripture. Next time you come, come like that. <laughs> Do you see what the difference there? Look at the dresses. Look at the hair. The reason I'm saying this is because there have been churches who've interpreted this passage to mean this. That this is how you ought to come here. But let me say this. Paul is just saying to you now. He's saying, when you come before God, be who you are. Before God, because God loves women in the same way as he loves men. He cares about them in the same way. And by the way, he accepts you just as you are. God loves you. He loves the way you are because he created you. And by the way, that is just an example. But what are the principles here? I've drawn to you the principles. What are the symbols of our 21st century? What is a symbol for a lady? So let me ask you a question. The people who are worshiping here this morning and leading us in worship, think about if one day they decided to come here in their speedos, and uh, they decided to worship in bikinis. What would you think? Joel, I can see that thought is running through your head. That's not what I'm saying here. <laughs> oh, guilty conscience. But anyway. Basically saying, when you come before God, you are coming before the Holy God. Be who you are. Be modest. Be presentable before God. 
Otherwise, if we were to say, let's take a literal approach to this, we would have a, a bag of berets outside and you would have to wear it. And by the way, if I ever saw you like that, you would look like one of the political party members in South Africa because they wear berets. I would not think you're looking great. <laughs> now. This is not just an example. This is also culturally bound. Because here's another example. If you go to other cultures right now, or other places in, in the Middle East, or in other parts of the world, and you walked in, and you stood before everyone, like I'm standing now, and you are not wearing a suit, you'll be very offensive. You'll be offending the people there. Why? If Paul went to that culture, and I was going to preach there, he'll say, Fussy, where's your suit? And I'll have to wear a suit. Why is Paul saying that? Because at the end of the day, I'm free, aren't I? I'm free to be who I am. Hey, he's saying, use your freedom well. Never use your freedom to cause others to stumble. Remember, he's just said that in the previous chapter. He says, I don't want to be a stumbling block to the Jews and to the Greeks. Because when the Jews came in and saw what was happening, they would be saying, this is not the church. Surely God has not blessed this at all. The Gentiles might not have a problem with that, but the Jews would have had a massive problem with that. Because they would have seen it, and they would have thought, God is not in this place. Because what they see is they see women without their covers on, and they're thinking, are they from the temple of prostitutes? If they saw men not, cover, not with uh, long hair, they would be saying, are these men trying to be women? But right now, that's not the case. When you see a man wearing a hat, you don't think a man is dismissing his authority. When you see a woman not covering her head, you're not thinking, oh, this is really bad. Do you think that? But there are principles which I've just articulated, which are when you come before God, be aware of this. But be who you are. God sees the headship. And he loves that. Women, husbands, wives, you're not sending a message that is not very unhelpful at the time of worship. But you're saying, this is who God has made me to be. So what? If that's the case, what do we make of this passage? Here are a few things I want to draw to you. The first one is this from what Paul is saying here. Men and women can approach God directly without any earthly mediator. Christ is your mediator. When a man comes before God, you don't need to come through anyone else. You come through Christ. When a woman comes before God, she doesn't need to come through anyone anymore. She comes through Christ. Which means Paul is saying here, a woman comes and she prophesies. How do, how do you prophesy? It's because you hear from God directly, isn't it? God speaks to you, and as he speaks to you, you deliver what God has said to you. And how do you deliver that? Because God has put something in you. What do we make of that? God speaks to you directly, and you can come to God directly. Whereas before that, before the cross, there was no way you could come to God directly. You could come to God only through a mediator, only through a priest. Do you see what Paul is saying here? We can say that this passage is arresting us, but this passage is liberating you. It's liberating you in that it's saying to you, ladies, you can come to God just as you are directly. You can approach God, and God can speak to you. And by the way, as God speaks to you, you can speak to the church what God wants to say to the church. Men, you can do the same as well. Directly, you have a direct access to God. Because your mediator is not here on earth. Your mediator is in heaven. It's Jesus Christ alone. He's the only mediator that we have. Secondly, God does speak to women in the same way as he does to men. God gives the gifts of prophecy to men and women alike. And as we come before God, it's a display of his glory and his beauty. And God delights in that. He says, look at this. This is the apple of my eye. I delight in this and I will give you the gifts. And he gives the prophetic gift. He gives other gifts to men and to women. And God has given you gifts. Ladies, you have been given gifts. Use your gifts. 
Because in the same way, in, the Corinth, in, in Corinth, the Corinthians, they were so in tune with the spiritual gifts. And they used the gifts. And I want to encourage you, as ladies here, use your spiritual gifts as God has given you. Third, f- thirdly, women are equal before God in value through the cross. Are equal, women, men and women are equal before God in value. That va- God values men. And values women the same way. He doesn't just value men. He values both of them together. And as we come before God, we come just as we are. Fourthly, God loves diversity. He doesn't just want us to be the same thing. He didn't create men to look like women and women like men. He's saying, as you come before me, ladies, as you look the way you are, I accept you, I love you, I delight in you. And by the way, during worship, God delights in how different and how unique we are. Because even as we sit here today, we have people from different cultures. God delights in that when we come to worship. We have people here who look very different. God delights in that as long as we know who we are in Christ. He enjoys the diversity that we have. Because if you read in Revelation 7, it speaks of the different tribes and tongues. That's incredible diversity, but we are one. We come together. We are different and we are who we are, but at the end of the day, we are one before God. Also, number five, we need each other. Because it says, man is not independent of woman. Woman is not independent of man. Although we are diverse, we function when we come together. We function better when we are together because God has been able to use this incredible diversity to bring us together and to say, man, you need ladies in this church. Ladies, you need men in this church so that we can function and work together. And lastly, you are what you are by the grace of God. God has made you who you are. And right now, it's not about what to wear what you eat, whatever you do, it needs to bring glory to Jesus. If it brings glory to Jesus, let's do it. If it's a stumbling block, let's talk about it. Because Paul is saying here in the previous chapter, I don't want to be a stumbling block. And I much rather we not stumbling blocks. When people come and they see us, they must delight in the worship here. They must focus on God and not what I'm wearing. But focus on God and see him. But also, I want to say this. Ladies, God wants to empower you to be who you are, to use your gifts, to thrive in this church, to be what God has created you to be. Men, God is calling us to rise up, to take our place, to really be who God has created us to be, to be so in tune with Christ as God has created us to be. And also the passage talks about a woman being the glory of man and a man being the glory of God. This is not glory in the way that is used in 1 Corinthians 10. This glory means when, when God looks at us, he delights in us. But also equally, when you look at your wife, you delight in your wife. That's what it means. It doesn't mean, oh, she was just created for, for this man's glory. Even as we come to an end, let's not allow the misconceptions that are rooted in culture, hearsays, what I've heard, what I've been taught. Let's go back to scripture again. Let's begin to understand the writings of scripture in this passage. Secondly, let's understand the principles and get the principles out of the scripture and say, this is what God is trying to communicate with us. And this is what we would embrace. And this is what we will run with. And we know that principles change, uh, don't change. But as symbols, they change in different cultures and different places. Because believe me, if I go now to certain countries and uh, women are wearing head coverings, and you know what I would say? I wouldn't say a thing. Because it's a symbol there and it's okay. In the same way as I will go to other countries and I would have to wear a suit. Have you ever seen me in a suit? All right, you should see me. The principles are there. Let's always look at what God is trying to say to us. And lastly, God has designed from creation 
as he says in, in Genesis, he created man and women. And he says, you are my delight. You, you are beautiful. You are very good. And today, as we come before worship, let there be a re true reflection of that. That what has happened is that the veil has been torn. Now, there's no longer a court for men and a court for women where only women can worship, only men can worship. Now we come under the same roof to worship the same God. And also, when we come, God sees us and he loves us the same. Also, when we come, we can be ourselves. And then when we come, we are a great diversity, a reflection of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us do that and embrace that in worship because that's what Paul is trying to teach us here. That when you come before God in worship, something is happening in the heavenly realm. Even angels are looking to see the beauty of what God has created here. And I want to say to you, be empowered to worship God. Let's stand together. I know that uh, many people have come from those traditions where a passage like this would have been read in a certain way for, I'll just say, especially for ladies here, this passage would have been read in a certain way and you would have found yourself feeling a sense of uncertainty in your, th in your heart but not knowing what to do, not knowing what. I just want to say God wants to bring freedom. And say, you are free before him. Free to be who you are. Free to worship. For guys here, you are free in God. Free to worship God. But hey, let that freedom be used for the glory of God. And the glory of God alone. Let's pray together.